Germany has a complicated history with its black people. While the country was not a major colonial power compared to other European countries, it did have a colonial presence in Africa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and it played a crucial role in the transatlantic slave trade. During the colonial period, Germany established several colonies in Africa, including Togo, Cameroon and Namibia. In Namibia, German colonial forces committed genocide against the Herero and Nama people, resulting in the deaths of tens of thousands of people between 1904 and 1908. The colonial authorities also forcibly recruited laborers and imposed harsh conditions on the local population. In addition to the colonial period, Germany also had a small but significant population of black Germans during the 20th century. Some of these individuals, also known as Afro-Germans, were descendants of black people in Germany since the 18th century and the children of African soldiers who were stationed in Germany during the First and Second World Wars, while others came to Germany as immigrants or refugees. During the Third Reich, when the Nazi party ruled Germany, black Germans were subjected to discrimination, persecution and violence along with other minority groups. They were classified as Rhineland bastards and subjected to forced sterilization under Adolf Hitler's eugenics program. Some black Germans were also interned in concentration camps and used as forced labor. After the Second World War, black Germans continued to face discrimination and marginalization despite legal protections against racism and discrimination. In recent years, there have been efforts to recognize and address the historical and ongoing discrimination faced by black people in Germany, including the establishment of organizations dedicated to promoting the rights and interests of black Germans. This episode looks at the brutal treatment and mass killings that Germany did to Africans and Afro-Germans. The start of a new century can be regarded as a new chapter in the annals of history, and with every new chapter, comes the first of everything, either good, bad, or dark, that would occur repeatedly in that chapter and subsequent ones. On the pages of dark events, it doesn't appear as a surprise that Germany did the honors of launching the first genocide of the 20th century with the Herero genocide. It would appear that the reason for the annihilation of about 75% of the Herero population in the space of four years was to serve as a general punishment to the entire race for their wrongdoings. And to be fair, if it could be considered fair at all from hindsight, rumor has it that it wasn't the German militia who struck the first blow. But while the reason may have been punishment for rebellion in the beginning, it progressively tended towards racial cleansing with time, the removal of the impure for the pure and the new to emerge. The tragic genocide which took place in present-day Namibia, which was then named German South West Africa, didn't just happen unprovoked. It could be said that it resulted from years of conflict and strife between the native Herero and the white German invaders. But maybe, just maybe, it wasn't meant to happen to the Herero people. For you see, they were not the original dwellers of the land. The San and the Khoi Khoi, being the original natives, were driven out of the territory to the dry, rugged hills by the Herero during the mid-18th century. The country flowed with milk and honey and had vast expanses of rich, arable land. So, 
the Herero being cattle herders, seize it for themselves. A century and a half later, the Germans would pay a visit to the African territory and, as was the craving of the era, subject it to colonial rule. German South West Africa formally became a German colony following the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, and it was then the historical path of both parties merged into what would become a blood-bathed part, haunted by ghosts of tens of thousands of black men, women, and children. Over the span of 10 years of colonization, the native groups were subjected to hard labor and had their land and livestock either seized or stolen by their colonial masters. That Germany didn't have richer African countries that promised profitable ventures under their colony wasn't the case. So, one would wonder why they bothered to disturb these nomads who had nothing to give but cattle. But you see, the land was what was in it for the Germans, for it was two times as large as their country, but the population of the natives paled in comparison to that of the Germans. So, it became a suitable settling place for the Germans in Africa and they wasted no time in establishing that as 3,000 Germans were comfortably settled on the central high ground of today's Namibia by 1903. This migration of the white men, albeit not so large, naturally led to conflict as there were not enough resources to cater to the needs of the natives and the settlers altogether. The socio-economic balance of the society was disrupted and overarching challenges of survival kicked off in earnest. The Germans would have had an easy ride over the people of Herero and the other natives of the land, despite their number, but for the industrious nature and quest for modernization of the Herero, who over the years had learned to ride horses and shoot guns. The first blow was dealt on the morning of January 12, 1904. Under the command of their leader, Chief Samuel Maharevo, the Herero clan carried out a coordinated attack on the German front in Okahanja in a bid to overthrow the colonial rule. By noon, the native soldiers had laid siege to the fort and despite the regulations placed by Maharero to avoid killing women and children, the women were not exempt from about 123 German settlers' casualties recorded that day. The Herero largely had a field day as the Germans were unprepared and unsuspecting of such an attack, which lasted for a few weeks. However, the Germans, under the command of Major Theodor Lutwin, who also served as the governor of the colony, began to call for reinforcements and ammunition supplies and fought back to defend themselves and wait off the enemy lines. As soon as the level of control was reached, Major Lutwin chose reason over retaliation and surmising that the German colonial garrison was outnumbered by the native fighters who were armed and brutal, he reckoned that the best line of action to take was to have a conflict resolution discussion with the Herero. Perhaps, if the negotiation had taken place, a compromise might have been reached and things would not have gone bad. But, either as fate would have it or by human engineering, that was not to be. His proposition was overruled by the German colonial office in Berlin, who made it crystal clear that peace was not an option. The fighting continued, and just as the governor fared, on April 13, 1904, the German troops were overwhelmed and the survivors returned to the base with tails between their legs. Consequently, Major Lutwin was relieved of his command of the military, and Lieutenant General Luther von Trotha was appointed by the German Emperor to take charge of the military. It is quite interesting that the Emperor was careful to select not just anybody, 
but one who was a colonial veteran of both the China Boxer Rebellion and the German East African Wars. No doubt about it, nothing short of delivery was expected of the general. On June 11, 1904, von Trotha stepped foot into German Southwest Africa. The fighting had ceased since April and up until his arrival, there were no confrontations whatsoever. The Herero had withdrawn from the area and taken refuge in the remote Waterberg Plateau, which was at the outskirts of the Kalahari Desert. They gathered their armies there to avoid further confrontations with the Germans, more so that more German troops, supplies and ammunition were spotted coming into the country. In optimism, they awaited a possible negotiation from the Germans to settle for peace, but they didn't entirely let their guard down in case they were attacked. The plateau was also well positioned for them to flee into British Bechuana land, which is present-day Botswana. They seemed to have all their cards right, but failed to consider one last card. Or perhaps they were oblivious to the change in command of the German troops. The new supreme commander was nothing like the old. He was as unpredictable as he was ruthless. In the space of two months, he stealthily encircled the Herero. Although the undertaking proved very difficult because he didn't have the complete maps of the entire area and he had to move heavy artillery across the rugged terrains of the plateau, he managed to pull it off. The general had just one move to make, destroy the African rebels in one sweeping blow. The Battle of Waterberg began on August 11, 1904. As soon as it was done, von Trotha ordered his 1,500 German soldiers to attack the band of about 40,000 Herero soldiers, of whom those armed were about 5,000. The Germans would ordinarily stand no chance against the Herero, but for two factors, they wielded to their advantage. One, the element of surprise, and two, their modern artillery. The Herero were woken up by shells and blasts and horrid frenzies of confusion as their place of refuge came crashing down in flames. When they attempted to attack the Germans, they were met with bullets from machine guns generously stationed all around them. By afternoon, the Herero conceded defeat and fled. Managing to break through a German flank southeast, they fled into the Kalahari in a bid to escape to British Bechuana land, present-day Botswana. In response, the general sent the Schutztruppe, which was the general name of the German colonial force in Africa, in pursuit of the African clan escaping through the desert. Thousands of Herero men, women and children lost their lives, either from being shot drinking poisoned water, or from thirst and starvation. Even those that surrendered were executed outrightly. Von Trotha continued to fill the oasis of the Kalahari Desert with black blood until October when his army couldn't go any further due to fatigue and exhausted supplies. The German troops returned to the central high grounds, but the war was far from over for von Trotha. The general stationed patrols across the desert so that no Herero could return to the vicinity now fully occupied by the German colonizers. Furthermore, on October 3, 1904, he proclaimed a new policy called the Extermination Order that ordered that all African natives found in the vicinity were to be executed on the spot without hesitation 
or exception. Von Chotha's extermination order was carried out for the next two months. It so turned out that not all in the emperor's court in Germany were in support of the staunch order. One in the name of Bernard von Bülow, who served as the Reich Chancellor of Imperial Germany, kept lobbying the emperor, who finally succumbed and rescinded the execution order on December 9, 1904. In its place, they adopted the British method of rounding up natives into concentration camps. The camps were placed in towns where the highest demand for labor was, and the Herero prisoners spent the next three years in subjection to hard labor and conditions of cruelty, building government projects with the majority of women and children sold or rented out to slave masters. They also suffered malnutrition, poor hygiene and starvation, and to mention the height of it, many of them were subjected to human experiments. The inhumane treatment and severe labor of the Herero during those years resulted in the death of over half of all the prisoners in the first year alone. Meanwhile, another uprising occurred down south as well. The Nama tribe rose up against the colonial masters in October 1904 and engaged the Germans in guerrilla warfare. But within two years, their fate became much the same as their native neighbors, as they also ended up either executed or incarcerated in concentration camps where they also had to suffer the wrath of the Germans in all its rawness. The most notorious camp the prisoners were sent to was Shark Island, which was off the coast of the harbour of Luderitz. Of all that were sent there, about 80% lost their lives. Germany single-handedly almost wiped out the Herrera race, for between 1904 and 1908, the entire Herrera population had been cut down to 25% as about 50,000 to 65,000 Herero had died, while about 50,000 of the Nama people also died, leaving their population at a meager number of 10,000 people. When the concentration camps were eventually closed down in 1908, the surviving prisoners were shared among the German settlers to serve as laborers in the German colony. To further substantiate their degraded state of being property, all Herero above seven years of age were mandated to wear a metal disc around their necks upon which their labor registration number was inscribed and they were prohibited from owning land, property or cattle, which was their major form of sustenance on their own soil. What's more unfortunate about this history cleansing is that it would not be until some 60 years later before the horrid incident would be acknowledged as what it really was, a genocide. the course of time, humans have experienced and endured difficult and dark events. Of all these dark periods in history, the darkest periods are undeniably those associated with wars. Casualties are the plus one package that comes with wars, for no matter how little, wars are never without devastating losses. And if there was a single ray of light in the dark times, 
The Second World War, with its unbelievably high number of fatalities, was probably pitch black. Not only does the Second World War hold the highest number of deaths recorded in any war, but it is famously known for its deadliness caused by the many gruesome acts of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, also known as the Nazis, led by Adolf Hitler. From the genocides to the Holocaust, which single-handedly killed about 6 million Jews, the Second World War created a long list of victims of different races who, quite unfortunately, became casualties in the six-year conflict. However, unlike the Jews, persons with disabilities and homosexuals who are publicly known as victims of the inhuman acts of the Nazis and their less humane leader, Adolf Hitler, a particular group of victims equally victimized and often omitted and thus denied the right to tell their story were the Germans of African descent. These unknown victims, also known as Afro-Germans, suffered extermination at the hands of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party during the Second World War. Since it is against logical reasoning that a rational person would leave their peaceful settlement to live in a region experiencing war, it is not probable to assume that the Afro-Germans arrived in Germany at the time of war. More likely, a black community had been there before the war began. In this light, it is significant to consider first the history of black people in Germany. The black community in Germany may be accurately described as a diamond in the rough. Their history goes far back to the beginning of slavery in the 18th century, to the colonization of African territories such as Cameroon, Togo, and today's Namibia by German colonial forces in the 19th century. Following the continuous stealing, oppressing, and incessant killing of the natives, the locals of the African territories revolted against the predatory German forces. As one would expect, the local Africans were far from being a worthy opponent to the German army. Even if they were, they lacked two weapons that the Germans possessed, cannons and an abundance of unreasonable hatred. Starting from this point, black people were carted away to Germany where many of the children and women were worked to death as slaves and the men drafted into the army. Many of these men died fighting for the Germans during the First World War. It is hard to estimate the exact number of Afro-Germans who died during this time, as black people, seen as inferior, were excluded from the German population censors. Why would a nation that prides itself in its pure-blooded superiority bother in making headcounts of the lesser ones? Could the German environment be any worse for black Germans? The emergence of the Nazi party and the rise of Adolf Hitler into power put some constrictions on the already constrained living conditions of the Afro-Germans. It is relatively known that Hitler and the Nazis, with their profoundly twisted ideology of a supreme, crystal-white pure blood, enacted the Nuremberg Laws prohibiting interracial marriages with native Germans. This ridiculous law would be enforced in 1935 during the rise of the Nazi government. However, what many do not know is that these laws were not only binding on the Jews, but on the Afro-Germans in Germany as well. Some of the living conditions of black people in Germany included persecution for having marriages with Germans, as well as being dismissed from education and job opportunities based on their skin color. Afro-German men were branded as rapists 
who preyed on morally weak white German women. Biracial kids of Afro-Germans and white parents were socially discriminated against and described with derogatory terms like Rhineland Palatinate bastards. Truly, living in Nazi Germany while being black was an experience that cannot be imagined. With all these actions, the stage was set for the extermination of the Afro-Germans by Hitler, which happened within the context of the Second World War. Based on this, it is crucial to examine the story behind the World War to fully understand the depth of crime committed by the Nazis. At any rate, the Second World War, which began in 1939, had a cause. Like all the wars fought in time, there were a number of contributing factors. The factors leading to the outbreak of the Second World War are still today a topic of interest and debate. In any case, a major contributing factor was the instability in Europe caused by the First World War, which started in 1914 and ended on November 11, 1918. The Nazis, prying on this weak state of Europe, opened an invasive battle in Poland. This attack was launched on September 1, 1939, and as if expecting the attack, two days later, France and Britain declared a counter-attack on Germany. Had the war involved just the two countries of Germany and Poland, it would hardly be referred to as a world war. However, Germany took the war to the Soviet Union, an established country comprising the now Russia and Ukraine, amongst others. It was at this point things took a downward spiral. Other countries began to spread the war by aiming for their perceived enemies until it became a full-blown war that killed millions of people and affected even more. At the center of this worldwide clash were two arch-political enemies, the Allies and the Axis, made up of the most powerful countries in the world. The Allies were the forces of Britain, France, the Soviet Union and the United States of America. The Axis forces were made up of Germany, Italy and Japan. Without a doubt, the most prominent name during the Second World War was Adolf Hitler. Hitler was made the leader of the Axis and under his leadership were the gruesome acts committed. The Second World War began in 1939 and continued to escalate until 1945. On the calendar, this is only a span of six years. However, for the victims and perhaps all countries of the world, the Second World War was a tragic series of events deeply etched into their memories. In any war, there are two types of victims. The victims who are known, whose stories are shared and the victims who are never recognized for their sufferings. Contrary to popular belief, the Jews were not the only victims of the Second World War and the Holocaust. Although Hitler had a rather unmatched hatred towards the Jews, he expressed just as much hatred towards black people and the Afro-Germans in Germany. Admittedly, the extermination of the Jews differs from that of the Afro-Germans. Nevertheless, at the root of it all was the Nazis' unreasoning prejudice, insatiable loss for killing and inhuman eugenics ideology. It is no wonder that the name Adolf Hitler has become a synonym for evil. In 1937, just two years before the Second World War began, the overly scared Nazis opted for the sterilization of the black Germans 
to muffle the growing population of the black community in the country. While one may think that forced sterilization of black Germans is cruel, the disdain of the Nazis for Afro-Germans had grown tremendously and at a later time during the Second World War, mass murder was the most probable option in eliminating the polluted blood of black Germans. Quite naturally, because the extermination methods used on the black Germans differed from that of the Jews, some question if what happened to Afro-Germans during the Second World War should be considered as genocide. Although the details of the extermination of the Jews were different from that of the Afro-Germans, the general patterns were similar as ideologies of racism and racial superiority could be found in both. Shockingly, from Adolf Hitler's autobiography, it is inferred that part of his anger towards the Jews was because he believed they played a part in bringing blacks into Germany. It would seem like that to Adolf Hitler, and indeed so. Anything less than 100% German blood was not German, not human, and therefore not qualified to live. A completely self-obsessed belief. But such was to be expected when unreasoning prejudice is at play. To be born of a mixed race is a simple matter to be sure. But to the proud and racist Nazi, this constituted a defect on their otherwise pure, undiluted and superior blood. This evidently showed the contempt of the Nazis, for nothing short of this would have produced the evil crimes committed against the Afro-Germans. Hitler's extermination of the Afro-Germans did not happen in a mass method. Perhaps this is why the exact number of Afro-Germans who died during the Second World War is still debated. But one thing is certain. Thousands of black Germans were killed and many more were rendered useless by sterilization during the Second World War. However, the cruel actions of the Nazis did conform to genocidal patterns. For instance, the forced sterilization of young and viral Afro-Germans in a bid to intentionally reduce the growing birth rate of the black community is nothing short of murdering the future of these black Germans. An argument put forward perhaps by those unable and or unwilling to accept Germany's genocidal acts towards black people in the past is the comparison of numbers. A ridiculous idea that the number of Afro-Germans affected was not high enough to be regarded as genocide. However, it must be noted that the action itself not the number of victims, play a major role in defining genocide. It is true that Nazi Germany desired to exterminate blackness from its perfectly pure white country, and even more true that they intentionally hurt and killed children in their quest for a pure Germany. In other cases, Afro-Germans were taken into extermination camps where they were overworked, underfed, tortured and used as samples for experiments by the Nazis who were obsessed with genetic purity. Although this may not count as genocide, it was the prominent way the Nazis achieved the extermination of Afro-Germans. These extermination camps were secret laboratories used by the Nazis to carry out experiments on genetics. A rather unusual type of experiment, but the Nazis were strong believers in eugenics and perhaps sought scientific evidence to support their belief that non-Germans, Afro-Germans and other ethnicities were indeed subhumans with lower hereditary and, by extension, human values. At any rate, Genocide or not, all must agree that Adolf Hitler and his prejudiced Nazi government 
committed moral and civil crimes against the Afro-Germans through the unjust extermination methods that were carried out. The bloody Second World War, which lasted for six years, finally came to an end in 1945, when the Soviet Union and Allied forces captured Berlin, the German capital, in a hard battle. At the brink of obvious defeat, Adolf Hitler, who had caused the murder of millions of people, added one more person, himself. It is nothing less than ironic that a man who had proceeded over the most fatal war would commit suicide. But Hitler's previous actions had shown how knotted his thoughts were. Hence, his suicide wasn't entirely surprising. And perhaps Hitler, in his arrogant pride, thought the Soviet Union unworthy of ending his life. This is very probable since the German leader himself hardly regarded anyone except pure-blooded Germans as humans. After the death of Adolf Hitler, Berlin fell and the Nazis surrendered, bringing an end to their oppressive rule in Germany. One could almost hear the tears of joy mixed with sadness as the Afro-German survivors of the war mourned their losses and dared to hope for freedom at the possibility of new governance. It is commendable that with such a dark history, the black community in Germany still exists. Subsequent studies place the number of Afro-Germans during the Nazi reign to be around 25,000. And recently, it has been recorded that over a million Afro-Germans currently live in Germany. While critics have expressed concerns over Germany's attitudes towards systemic racism in the world today, it is also clear that changes, however little, have occurred in the living conditions of black people in Germany. As it is popularly said, history unlearned is history repeated. A repeat of the Second World War could end the world and humans faster than climate change. This proves the initial point that it is important to tell the untold story of the Afro-Germans as this would provide a wider perspective on the diverse methods the Nazis used to express their inhumane ideologies. The Holocaust is an unforgettable event for mankind and it should remain that way. Not just for the sake of truth and learning from it, but for the sake of the Afro-Germans and other unknown victims who still need the opportunity to share their story. Interestingly, Germany was not the only country to have committed genocide against Africans because at the same time that the Herero and the Nama people of present-day Namibia were being wiped off by von Chotha, Belgium, under King Leopold II, was also carrying out ethnic cleansing of Africans in Congo. You can check out the full story in our next episode.